Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Therapy Ed, it is my pleasure to be presented tonight's webinar about frequently asked questions about the 2024 MBCOT exam and effective MBCOT exam preparation for OT exam candidates. I'm Rita Fleming Cottrell, and I am Therapy Ed's Director of OT Education, the editor of Therapy Ed's Review and Study Guide, and a Therapy Ed course instructor. And I've had the pleasure to meet several of you because I see some names there I recognize who during Therapy Ed's online office hours that we conduct every Tuesday for free. For those of you who don't know me, I've been an occupational therapist for over 44 years, specializing in mental health practice, community participation, disability rights, and historical literacy. In addition to my therapy ed roles, I am Professor Emeritus at the University of Scranton and the Chairperson of Occupational Therapy Leaders and Legacy Society History Preservation Project. In 1993, I became a program director, and that was when I became involved with helping students prepare for their certification exam. In 1998, I joined therapy ed, so I've been doing this for 30 years. It goes quick. In 1998, I joined Therapy Ed to work on the first edition of the Review and Study Guide, which was published in 2000. 23 years later, we have just completed the 10th edition of this text, which has been completely updated to reflect the 2024 MBCOT exam for the occupational therapist. Today, I am, I am joined by Dr. Paula Carey, who is a Therapy Ed course instructor, an item writer, and a tutor, who's been instrumental in ensuring that Therapy Ed's courses are consistently on point. Paula? Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, Rita, uh, somebody sent, put a message in the chat that evidently we must be maxed at 300 because oh. um, other people have been trying to get in and they're not able to. Oh, I thought that was odd. Wow, yeah. that's a shame. So that I just know from the chat. Okay. Thank you, whoever's in the chat. Please um, text your friends and let them know that uh, we will make this recording available and maybe I'll plan another session. That is a shame. All right, yeah, that would you. be good. Because I did check on that. So since I'm the moderator, everyone, I'm not going to take up a lot of your time, but I actually, because uh, I knew Rita was going to say how long she's been in OT, I had to stop and think. So I started out my career in occupational therapy as an OT assistant. So if I count the time that I became a COTA and then went on to get my OTR, I've been an OT practitioner for 41 years and two of those years as an OTA and then um, the other 39 years as an OTR. And I taught full time at Utica University for 32 years, two years adjunct, and I've been teaching for therapy ed for 23 years now. So it's a pleasure to be here. I love being um, one of the course instructors and always behind the scenes. We're working on developing the courses and I'm absolutely in love with being a tutor. So that's one of the big things that I do as well. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here to find out what's going to be happening in 2024. I am right now texting to ask if we can increase the Zoom. So we will see if that works. And Don, and pa, I just did that for Betsy. If you would mind, if you wouldn't mind texting Tom to ask him if he could increase our Zoom capacity, because I see more people that are trying to get in. Um, and apologize to those of you. I'm glad you guys made it, but I do apologize to your peers that this is not happening. But we will move on because you are here and there's 300 of you. So we need to pay attention to your needs. Okay. All right, so to ensure our podcast some logistics to start off, to ensure a positive experience and to decrease distraction, we have muted everyone. But if you have any questions during the formal presentation, please jot them down. This presentation is intentionally designed to answer frequently asked questions. So it's likely that you'll receive an answer at some point during it. But, and we will follow the formal presentation by an open Q&A session, during which you'll be invited to place your questions in the chat box. If at any point during the presentation something is not clear, please place your concern in the chat box and Paula is going to be monitoring that and provide the needed clarification. As we noted, the session is being recorded and will be posted on Therapy Ed's YouTube channel. And the link to this post will be sent to program directors and shared on the AOTA community page and Therapy Ed's Facebook page. As you see when I'm go when I go through the slides, you're going to see that there's a lot of screenshots from the 10th edition of the review and study guide. So because that this session is completely copyright copyrighted, so we are asking you to honor that protection and not take any audio recording, video recording, screenshots, or transmit any of this information via Quizlet. 
We appreciate your compliance with our professional um, ethical standards. And um, again, we will be posting this on YouTube. So what are objectives? The session is seeking to answer your questions about the 2024 exam by providing accurate content and current content and helpful information about the 2024 OTR certification exam, the format and content. I will also be talking about the new six option multi-select scenario set items, the administration scoring for the 2024 OTR certification exam. And I wanna spend a bit of time about the need to obtain and use test taking ADA accommodations if you're eligible, because those are often critical to success. And most importantly, also the importance of being a critical consumer of exam preparation products to ensure that they are current accurate, relevant, and effective. You are all blessed with a lot of products out there. So you really want to make sure you're a critical consumer to make that what you are using is going to truly help you prepare for the exam in an effective manner. I'm also going to highlight strategies and resources for structuring an efficient review of your professional education to ensure a mastery of the knowledge that is required for MBCOT exam success and resources for developing your effective test-taking strategies to help you successfully pass the MBCOT exam. As many of you likely know, sometimes you may know your content, but figuring out the best answer can be challenging. So we'll talk about resources for that. Okay, what is the new 2024 exam like? What is the format? The MBCLT OTR exam beginning in, on January 2nd, 2024 is gonna be composed of 180 multiple choice items that include traditional three and four option, single response multiple choice items, and six option, multi-select scenario items. And I'll be showing you what these look like in a few minutes. Important thing to know is that there's no separate section for scenario sets. In the past, there was something called clinical simulation items, and there was a separate section for that that was at the beginning of the exam. Now there is no separate section. So it's all blended together. They're distributed throughout the exam in between the traditional items. And there's no predetermined percentage as how many are gonna be the traditional multiple choice, or how many are gonna be the scenario set. So for the three or four option single response multiple choice, these are the things you're used to taking in your, in your programs a lot, okay? And in your prerequisites, you basically have an answer, three options or four options, you pick the best answer. The six option multi-select are unique. They're different than what you typically see in school. You are going to have an item that will have six options and you will need to choose three correct items. For all of the exam items, in the in on the test, there are no answers that are provided in a combination format. So there's no B and D, all, none of the above. They're each clean and distinct. Okay, so here's an example. I'm going to ask you to put it into chat box what you think the correct answer is. So the question is: an occupational therapist provides services to enhance the independence and safety of residents of a skilled nursing facility. They perform periodic screening of residents' fall risk. What is the primary purpose of this fall risk of screening? And if you could put in the chat box what you think the correct answer is. And I just did receive a response back to my text saying that they cannot increase the number in the room. And I I guess because it's because it's short notice and we've already started, but that we will likely be able to schedule another one and will also be recorded. So if you want to let your peers know that, that we'll just be scheduling another one. That would be helpful. All right, let's see what people are thinking. All right. Chesney. I think I saw a Chesney there. Chesney, you pick D along with some of your peers, but some other people pick some other choices. Can you explain, Chesney, why you selected D? Because you are correct. Yeah, so the reason, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so the reason I chose D is because if we're gonna be doing a screening, we're just understanding where the patient's at. Yes, you picked up on a very important keyword. Okay, did you happen to take a therapy ed course? <laughs> no, not, not yet. yet. Okay, very, very good. Because a lot of times people miss that. And those of you who are like, huh, we I highlight in the therapy of course the different keywords. And Chesney did a great job. And those of you who picked D did a great job of picking out this keyword. 
because your correct answers have to be consistent with the OT process. And according to the OT process, the outcome of screening is determining the need for evaluation. Does the person need to be further evaluated for services? Then based upon that evaluation, you would maybe be determining if modifications are needed, you would develop an intervention plan, or you would adapt things. But until you do a complete evaluation, you cannot do that. So that's an excellent explanation, Chesney. Thank you. Now I'm going to give you an example of a scenario set. So what a scenario set is, there'll be four items, as I mentioned. And each one will have information that will be repeated for each item. So this is the background information that will be repeated for four items. And it says an older adult is recovering well from a recent myocardial infarction and is nearing discharge from an inpatient cardiac rehabilitation unit. This is the patient's second MI, and they have a secondary diagnosis of COPD. So that information will follow you for all four sections. It will be on each screen. So this is item one of the four. Anticipation of discharge, the patient and therapist have established intervention goals, focus on development of skills needed to safely engage in desired home management and leisure activities. Which activities are best for the occupational therapist to incorporate into three intervention sections? Select the three best choices. Now, because we have a lot to do this evening, I'm not gonna have you put this in the, in the um, chat box because we um, have a lot to discuss. At the end, if people wanna go back to this, I will, but I'm gonna show you the correct answer. And I'll give you a minute to just think about it and then see if you're on the right path. Okay. So the correct answers would be B, C, and D. And how you would determine the correct answer is where, is based upon MET levels, okay? And we will we will discuss the chapter content that covers that, okay? Now I'm going to show you the next one. Again, it has the opening scene that gives you the same basic information. But now it's saying that during the initial session, focused on home management activities, the patient's initial SpO2 rate of 95% drops to 89%. Based on this response, which should therapists do with the client during the session? So what am I going to do during the session? So I'm going to do a great exercise task, first lip breathing, the valve saliva maneuver. I'm not sure if I pronounced it right. Educate them about the signs of decreased vital capacity, the borg dyspnea scale, activities to replace the, the no longer that they can no longer perform. Again, in the course, this is actually one that is in the course, so we would review this and go over it in the course, but I just want to show you what these look like and how you go about them. And you basically would pick three correct. And one would be having them perform first lip breathing, educating them about body capacity, and using the Borg dyspnea scale, dyspnea scale to monitor them. Okay, so that's what the format is going to look like. So how is it scored? Okay, the exam is scored. Okay, I need to move this out of the way. Hold on. Basically, it's pretty straightforward. You get credit for selected correct answers, for selecting correct answers. Now, these pictures here of exam hints, like the one that was about there's no um, you know, com combo answers, these are directly taken from the review and study guide. So throughout the review and study guide, we have exam hints. And a number of them give you exam test-taking hints. So it lets you know there's no penalty for incorrect answers. So you never want to leave a blank. So say you were not sure, say you knew about purse lip breathing and you said about signs of decreased vital capacity, but you weren't sure about the Borg dyspnea cell, you're not so sure. It's okay to guess because they'll they'll count the two that you get, or if you left a blank and you pick something else out, they will count the two out of three you got as correct. And they don't take away any points for leaving anything blank. Okay. Now each exam contains items that are not scored because the MBCOT is field testing them for future exams. So they're interspersed throughout the exam. But there's no identifying characteristics to know what is scored or unscored. So you need to answer them as if they're being scored and if they're operational. Now, I always tell students when I teach in the course that use this to your advantage, okay? Because the GRE does this. They, don't, they, they have items on the exam that are not being scored, but they let you know the section. Now, you won't know. But my, my advice is, if you get an exam item that you don't like and you don't think that it's it's not clear to you, it's a little confusion, confusing, say to yourself, 
you know, it's probably not going to be scored. And the reality is that may likely be very true because you have to understand when every MBCOT item is written by exam content experts who are trained in how to write good items, then they go for peer review and then they go on the exam and don't count. So by the time an exam item counts, it's been very well vetted to be clear and relevant. So if the exam item, you know, maybe makes you feel not so great, it likely may is maybe won't be one that is counting. Okay. Um, but again, they don't take anything off for incorrect answers. So you're always moving ahead and gaining points. Now, the MBCOT exam uses statistical procedures to convert the test scores into scale scores, ranging from 300 to 600 and for 450, just like the GRE has a very large score. They don't give percentages like you get in your um, on your course exams. Okay, so what's the bottom line about the new format? I know I... I had a meeting with the program director of Duke University today talking about integrating exam into the curriculum and hosting a course there. And she was at, you know, she was wondering how is the, you know, what is the difference between this and the, pa the past exam? And to be perfectly honest, the 2024 exam is less intimidating and more test taker friendly. Rather than having to answer yes or no to a varying number of answer options in the clinical simulation test items, because they would say it was six to 12 options, but you never knew when you went through all four sections okay. of the three scenario test items out of all those 12 sections, how many options there would be to answer. So there is a varying, there's no varying number now. There's, it's set. You have to answer three out of six. So that takes away some, you know, unknown. And uncertainty when you take an exam sometimes can be anxiety producing. The other thing, instead of all four section CST items, which were at the beginning of the exam, so you had to do them all at the same time, and you know, pace yourself so you had enough time for the 180 multiple, 170 multiple choice test questions. They are no longer in a separate section; they're interspersed throughout. So your pacing can be a little not so worried about. I have to get all this done. And a very significant thing that is very user friendly for you as a test taker is in the previous edition of the exam, which began in 2019 and is in fact to 2023. Once you selected yes or no for one of the six to 12 options, you could not change your answer. So if all of a sudden you realize, oh, I made a mistake, I missed screening, I mean, I shouldn't be evaluating, and you, you couldn't change your answer. Now, if you read a scenario set item, and you see you missed the word screening, you can change your answer for any of the three out of six you selected. And that's huge, okay? that's a, That relieves a lot of stress. So the bottom line about the new format is it's much more test friendly and less intimidating. Okay, so now the big question is, what do I need to know to pass the exam, right? Because we all know the depth and breadth of OT is pretty big. So what do I need to know? So an important thing, to, first of all, to know about the exam is that every five years, MBCOT surveys practicing OTRs to determine the tasks that comprise entry-level practice and the knowledge required to perform these tasks. And the outcomes of that practice analysis is what is used to construct the content of the exam its specifications, and to guide the item writers in constructing the items. Important thing to also know is so we, it's, it's surveying practitioners. So it's based on practice. But an important thing to also know is MBCOT considers entry-level practitioners to be those who have been certified for 36 months or less. So it's up to the first three years of practice. So the exam tests generalist knowledge that is required for entry-level practice. It does not test any advanced or specialized knowledge. It does not test about the NICU, which one exam products has NICU questions in it and information about the NICU. The MBCOT exam is not going to test that. It also doesn't test anything that requires any additional certification. Okay, so it doesn't test the entry-level knowledge. And when the item writers, when they say guide item writing, they use core textbooks that they survey OT program directors to say, what are the textbooks used in your program? And the, item writers, the item writers use that information that are in the entry-level textbooks that the, OT program directors, that the OT program directors identify to inform their, oh. their items. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Let's, Paula, are we able to mute? Okay. Let me okay. mute. I can, I can, but then I'll mute you. Want me to do it? Yes, do that. And I'll okay. unmute myself. Oh, you got it.
Thank you. Okay. All right. So when they say it informs the exam content outline, what's on the exam? Basically, the MBCOT published their content outline. Every five years, you have to practice analysis. And for many, many years, it's been based upon four domains of OT practice. And then for each of the domains, they give specific task and knowledge statements for each of them. So for example, domain one is evaluation and assessment. And that is defined as acquiring information about the factors that influence occupational performance on an ongoing basis throughout the OT process. So our initial evaluation and the reevaluation we do across the way. So under this, they have a number of tasks. And one of the tasks is identifying the influence of development and lived experience, body functions and structures, values, beliefs, and spirituality, and identity on occupational performance. So basically it's saying you need to have a holistic view of the whole person to be able to evaluate and assess. And then they say, under that task of having that holistic evaluation that considers all dimensions of the person, they list tasks. And one of the tasks is you got to know typical development and aging, and they impact on occupational performance, health, and wellness across the lifespan. Now you can go right to MBCOT's website and click on, it says exam, and then it says what's on the exam, and you click on the 2022, because this content outline was done in 2022. And you can see all the tasks. Now what I've done, is I've selected certain ones because we don't have time to go through all of them, but I've selected um, key ones that were reviewed. Now I showed the first domain, which is evaluation and assessment. That is comprised of 23% of the exam. The next domain is analysis, interpretation, and planning. And that's about formulating conclusions. So my treatment planning, like for my evaluation, I do my treatment plan regarding the, con the client needs and priorities to develop and monitor that intervention plan throughout the OT process. So it's how I do my intervention review, how I do my plan. That's also 23%. Then the next third domain is selecting and managing interventions. So that's about selecting and in implementing interventions to promote healing and engaging and en enhance engagement in occupation-based activities. So that is the doing process of OT. You know, you can't actually do it on an objective exam, but can you identify and select the interventions that will maintain the person's health and help them engage in performance? So that example is a cardiopulmonary one by teaching the person's personal breathing, teaching them how to um, be aware of their exertion. You're helping them engage in the, in the activity. And that's 38% of the exam. So that's the most, the largest percentage on the exam. And then domain four are those indirect services. It's called competency and practice management. But these are all the professional activities that you have to do for yourself, like competence and making sure you're doing evidence-based practice by being informed about research. The activities of yourself and others, such as team members, as guided by evidence, regulatory compliance. You need to know your laws. You need to know your, your reimbursement standards. And standards of practice to promote, promote quality of care. And that's 16% of the exam. Hello. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to um, go through each of those dom these domains. And I'm going to tell you how many tasks are on, are related, the tasks that are related to each domain. And I'm going to give you some examples from the book of some of the knowledge statements. And what I've done is I selected knowledge statements that either over the years have made people anxious because they're concerned about knowing it all and or new ones that are, are unique, that are new for the 2024 exam. Now, my goal is, is not to stress you out. My goal is to let you know that there is gonna be a resource that will be able to walk through all this content knowledge. And I wanna demonstrate how you will not have to go and get all your, buy your books back that you sold or the ones that you returned because you rented them or Xerox multiple PDFs. The knowledge that is required on the exam is knowledge that has been covered in your program. It's knowledge that is in the core textbooks and it's knowledge and content that we have pulled to compose the review and study guide. Okay, so the three tests on the evaluation assessment is again, the one about being um, the influence of development and lived experience. It's that whole holistic approach. The other is how do you assess their skills, roles and needs and wants and performance context to evaluate their occupational performance and activity analysis. This is one they've emphasized in more than prior tests. That how do you that whole person activity fit? So how do you value the person? How do you assess the um, activity so you get that just right fit? Okay, 
So there are nine knowledge statements that are provided for those three domain one tasks. So underneath those three domains, there's several knowledge statements. And one, of the, one is the first one that I showed you about the impact of typical development. Now, chapter five in the review and study covers complete human de development across the lifespan. And if you do a quick scan, you'll see it covers it all from play to cognition, to ADL, IDL, to prevoke. We do have a table front and center in that chapter about the CDC guidelines, because a lot of people have been asking, and there are some people who erroneously think that if you study the CDC guidelines, they'll be sufficient. The reality is they are not sufficient, because as, as in this table, and this comes from AOTA and the CDC, but AOTA gave a good summary of the CDC guidelines and relevance to OT. There are limitations to these. These are screening, they can be used as screening or diagnostic tools, and they used to establish initial assessment for the initiation, continuation, or termination of OT services. And part of those OT services, though, is a, a skilled eval of development. They do not have the complete developmental milestones that you need to know, okay? And MBCOT has also said that, that it does not cover all of the information that is in are your textbooks. It doesn't cover the specific assessments, developmental assessments. Chapter five does, okay? The other thing that is of important, again, one of those nine knowledge statements is a statement that says the internal and external factors that influence a client's engagement and occupation that you need to know that. And they give examples. So our role, habits, and routines. So what we learn before an occupational profile, our environmental context, our family and social supports. But it also says you need to know those internal and external factors related to medication side effects and interactions. So in the review and study guide, we have different caution boxes that let you know these are things you need to be aware of to be safe. And side effects and interactions are one of them with medications. So this is an example of a caution that is in chapter 14 or 10. A complication that occurred with secondary generation antipsychotics is development of metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a cluster of conditions it gives you all the, the, the criteria that are high risk factors for heart disease and stroke. Chapter nine will give you more information about metabolic syndrome. So if you're not familiar and say, I never heard that before, it refers you to chapter nine. Another precaution for those of the, of the cardiac in the cardiac chapter in chapter eight, if a person's taken aspirin or any non sterile anti inflammatory drugs, clotting may take longer. Okay. So these are cautions because the MBCOT exam, as you probably heard, number one rule is be safe. Okay. I just want to give you a screenshot that shows you that chapter 10 covers all the diagnostic things you need for psychiatric and cognitive disorders. And chapter 14 covers all the psychosocial, approach, psychosocial approaches and intervention. So in this chapter, we cover the medications for psychiatric um, disorders that are treated. And here we cover all the interventions um, and assessments that are used with people with psychiatric diagnoses. Okay. The other... Another knowledge statement that is in, related to domain one and the task of domain one is knowing the influence of lived experiences and identity on occupational performance. Some example includes a history of trauma and adverse childhood events. So therapy as review and study guide provides comprehensive information about child, elder, patient, client abuse, domestic abuse, and intimate partner violence including their prevalence, definitions, types, and signs, because that's all the information that you need to know to know what is the how does adverse effects, you know, events and trauma affect someone. And it gives you information about our role, our legal responsibility on the Childhood um, Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, and the intervention foci and approaches for people who are surviving and or living with, with um, domestic violence or violence. Table 14.3 in chapter 14 covers the radar approach for domestic abuse and intimate, um, intimate partner violence, screening and response. And again, I'm not going to go over all these tables, but I want you to be aware that that information is there because that will be the information that you need to apply to determine the correct answer. Again, this is an example of how the, ex the exam hints are provided in the book. So in each chapter, we link a content knowledge statement to the information that is provided in the chapter, okay? And comprehensive information, this is an example from chapter 10 about schizophrenia, but comprehensive information about the conditions that limit occupational performance 
across all body systems are provided in chapters six through 10. Okay, so chapter 10, I already showed you the pick of psychosocial and cognitive, psychiatric and cognitive. Chapter six is musculoskeletal system disorders, and it covers all the different musculoskeletal conditions from arthritis to hip replacements to amputations. Chapter seven comes and covers neurological systems from stroke to Parkinson's disease to MS to sensory processing disorders. Chapter eight covers your cardiopulmonary system disorders from myocardial infarctions to COPD, to cystic fibrosis. And chapter nine covers all your gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal renal, during, I'm going to mispronounce it, endocrine, immunological, and intergubernatory. I mispronounce again, I apologize. But basically covers everything from heat syndromes to wounds to AIDS to COVID to swallowing nostalgia disorders. So it covers the whole gamut. So in one place, you'll be able to study all the conditions that you need. Okay. So what else do you need to pass the exam? Domain two, which is analysis, interpretation, and planning. And domain two also has three tasks. One is synthesizing your assessment results to determine eligibility for services and establish the client-centered intervention plan. The other is collaborating with the client and the client's relevant others and OT colleagues and other professionals to do that client center plan and use therapy yourself. And the other is modifying it and monitoring it to make sure you're using your clinical reasoning that it's meeting the person's needs. So those are the three tasks. Now under those three tasks in domain two, there's 12 knowledge statements. And again, I picked a couple that are representative. And one knowledge statement that you must know for competence safe practice according to MBSOT is knowing how to interpret qualitative fi findings, including an occupational profile. We have the handy dandy table in chapter three that covers the key questions for obtaining an occupational profile. Okay, so you scroll and see these, and these would be questions now, and that would be the correct answer on an MBCOT exam. Now, I couldn't fit the entire box on this, on this slide, so just to let you know, box two does cover additional questions that to obtain the person's occupational history and to understand their personal and environmental factors that may hinder their engagement in their desired occupations and performance of life activities. So chapter three has comprehensive information related to the attainment, obtainment of an occupational profile. Chapter three covers a lot of the foundations of OT practice. So the entire OT process, so that stages of the OT process like screening, intervention planning, intervention review, discharge, and termination of um, intervention. It covers one of the um, statements that I showed, talked about therapy use itself, covers that. Occupation activity analysis was one of the other statements that, you know, tasks that you must know. So it covers all these foundational things, group dynamics, okay? And, and then competency and practice management is another chapter that is very inclusive and covers many foundation, much foundational information that you know to answer the exam. I, and then I'll show some screenshots related to this chapter also but it covers particularly that whole working with other people, our OT practitioner roles, and how we work with others to collaborate with the team and collaborate with family members. Okay. Another knowledge statement for domain two is knowing the precautions or contraindicators associated with client's condition or stage of recovery. Some examples include, this is new to 2024, okay? So we do have about vital signs in, chap in chapter eight, and laboratory values also in chapter eight. So it tells you the different ions, concentrations, and the functional relevance of them, okay? How they increase or depress your heart rate. So it does give you that basic information that you need to know. All right, domain three, what do you need to know for domain three? Domain three also has three tasks. And again, this is the one that's 38% of the exam. So you're gonna have more knowledge statements, but it's looking at preparatory techniques activities and modalities, so things we do to prepare the person and as an adjunct to promote healing and enable to engage in occupation-based activities. Then it covers the implementing our occupation-based interventions, support participation in ADL, IADL, rest, sleep, education, work, play, leisure, social participation. Please to say we have a chapter that covers all of those occupations. And then selecting and improving, implementing, oops, sorry, selecting and implementing interventions for improving the sensory motor, the neurological, physiological states. So my evaluation intervention approach is to improve that so the person is able to engage in occupation and support occupation. 
Okay, so what is the, some of the knowledge statements? This 29, domain three. So we're certainly not going to go over all 29. But I picked a couple that are also, again, ones that often raise concern. And um, I want to highlight how it's covered in the book. One is about orthoses. Okay, and one of the knowledge statements, you need to know the types and functions of immobilization, mobilization, and restriction orthoses for managing specific conditions and congenital anomalies and limitations, implications of the anatomical, physiological, biomechanical, all the factors that relate to orthotic selection, design, and fabrication. Throughout the book, we have some pictures for those of you who are visual learners to help you when someone says ulna drift, what does that mean? Ski is thumb. So we have pictures to help you see them. Okay. Chapter 11 covers, covers all biomechanical approaches and evaluation and intervention. Chapter 12, neurological. And each of these cover orthoses. Okay, orthotics for neuromuscular and under intervention. We don't have this listed because so many intervention is orthotics in chapter 11. Okay. This is a very important point about why the therapy at a review and study guide is very helpful because you we will have orthotics for many conditions. We have orthotics about for burns, neurological, so not just about hand injuries. I also want to highlight that we co cover the approaches according to like frames of reference. And we also have a whole chapter on cognitive perceptual evaluation and intervention approaches. Okay, another statement that is in domain three that you need to know are indications, contraindications, and precautions for wound management and maintain skin integrity. So stage of wound healing, we have wound healing. We have a very nice figure in chapter nine that shows those and we have the descriptions. And prevention and management. And in chapter nine, we have, you know, what are the factors that predispose a person to ulcers? And these would be the things that you would be trying to prevent or, or helping the person learn to manage. An important thing that we again try to always emphasize is to call your attention to the broader picture. You know, in chapter nine, you're studying it relating to, you know, the, the section about skin integrity. But wounds, you need to know, kind of a compilation of any diagnosis that compromise a person's sensory motor, cardiopulmonary, renal, immunological, and endocrine systems. So to know that the information in nine is applicable to many other diagnoses, not just the diagnoses covered in chapter nine. Another thing that you need to know from the MBCOT exam and knowledge state re related to domain three is ergonomics and universal design to identify, recommend, and implement, and also know in reasonable accommodations in the workplace. Chapter 16 covers the universal design and reasonable accommodations, and chapter 15 covers ergonomics in our work session. So we have a table that goes through all the principles of universal design, and all seven are described in this table with an example. Okay. And again, chapter 16 goes over all those things about universal design, evaluation of the home, functional mobility, evaluation of the environment, driving cessation, driver rehabilitation. And chapter 15 is the chapter that covers all those statements that relate to all occupations from health management to ADL to IADL to work, play, education. Rest and sleep is also covered in that chapter. Okay, another area of concern often is knowledge about our physical agent modalities. And they specifically talk about contraindications for super superficial thermal agents and contraindications for deep thermal mechanical electrotherapeutic physical agent modalities. And we, again, we have red flags in the chapter because they really call your attention to saying, okay, these are the contraindications. I'm not gonna use electrical stim with this group of people. And I'm not gonna do heat with this group of people. So you want to pay attention to those red flag boxes. And then another content knowledge is knowing high and low tech technology and adaptive devices and knowing our options for interface and process, processor parameters and equipment, and equipment components. And we have a whole table and quite a bit in chapter 16 about assistive technology. And these are all the computer adaptations that you can use. And it, it actually goes, goes further. There's more under this. This is just the keyboards. And then there's other adaptations. It basically takes up a page. All right. Going to do no, domain four. Okay. So domain four, there's four tasks. Using evidence-based practice and approaches, incorporating risk management, providing OT in accordance with laws and regulations and practice life and accreditation, 
and engaging in professional development and competency. Okay, so those are the four main tasks. Now I'm gonna go over some of the knowledge statement. So evidence-based programming is under domain four and it's 12 knowledge statements related to all of them. And one of the things you need to know is Baltimore population health outcomes. And two things really tied is aging in place and fall prevention. Chapter 16 covers fall prevention and aging in place quite extensively. And this is just one table that talks about risk factors. And these risk factors are things you would need to know about what you would, for an exam item, need to address in the home. And it goes through the kitchen, it goes through the bedroom, it goes through the remainder of the house. The other thing that's in domain four that you need to know for a knowledge statement is locating and reviewing critically, reviewing, interpreting critically appraised and scholarly research, okay, to guide your practice relevant decision making. We have a box in chapter four that goes through all the CAT process. And box, this is goes up to the PICO question is what fit. Box four, two, six covers all the steps in the CAT process. And then reimbursement. You need to know your Medicare. It's only on national health insurance. In chapter four, we provide all information about Medicare Part A, Medicare Part B, durable medical equipment, homebound status. These are the two that fit the best in the slide. We have homebound status, Medicaid, Medicare A, Medic, and um, also Part B and, and um, durable medical equipment as seen here. So it's all there. And then a new one added for 2024 is professional burnout. NBC, and I think that has a lot to do with our post-COVID world and our COVID world. So you want to make sure that you know how to prevent burnout. So we included a section in burnout. And this table include this table goes through all the individual things you can do to prevent burnout. You can see they align very nicely with the examples that NBCOT provide. And they also cover strategies for supervisors and administrators. So it's only that because it could be that you're a supervisor because remember it's one to zero to three years. So you could be supervising someone after one to two years. So you could have questions about being a supervisor. So that will cover burnout. I, I know this is a lot and I, you know, touch part of the surface. Okay. The reality is MBCOT exam does test the depth and breadth of OTR practice. So the amount of content knowledge that is tested is a lot. It's understandable. But I think it's very important to need to know if you are preparing to take the MBCOT exam, You've earned the status of exam candidate. You are no longer a student. So congratulations. You should pat yourself on the back. It's a big achievement. OT school is not easy. To accomplish this, you had to pass challenging coursework. Just think of the prerequisites you had to take and all the tests you had to take and prerequisites to even get into your program. And you had to pass your field work and then your professional um, coursework. So you clearly know a lot. And you have the skills that you can apply to your MBCOT exam preparation. Will you likely want guidance to do this effectively? Of course, you know, because you've been out on field work, you've maybe done a capstone. It's been a while since you've studied for an exam and maybe never one this broad. But fortunately, Therapy Ed has over 25 years of experience in doing this. But before I move into what we, we do in our different resources, I'm gonna go give you a brief overview and just highlight them since 1997. Therapy has been a leader in preparing graduates for the MBC OTR exam. They include the review and study guide and three practice exams that come with them, online and on-site preparation courses, individual and group tutoring, as Paula mentioned, she is a tutor, free online weekly off office hours and content review sessions, exam items week that we post on social media, and we record these sessions we, um, that we do when we post them on, on YouTube. Now, before I move into going over each of these resources, I want to talk about something very important, a question that's frequently asked, and I wish it was asked more often. I have a disability, but do not use accommodations to take tests during my program. Should I apply? Do I need to apply for MBCOT testing accommodations? My answer is always yes. But I recognize the decision requests or not request testing accommodation. For the MBC is very personal. It's often influenced by your personal experience with taking accommodations during your OT education. Many people find they don't use their accommodations during their test in their program. But it's very, very important to recognize that this experience is not generalizable to the MBCOT exam. The content format and test taking experience at MBCOT exam is very different from your experience of taking course specific exams. Therefore, 
If you can get accommodations because you have a disability that support your success, we strongly urge you to apply for any and all accommodations for which you are eligible. Because here's the deal, and this is table in chapter one. The activity demands and environmental context of the MBCOT exam vary greatly. On course exams, it's usually well-defined course content, MBCOT, depth and breadth of entry level key practice. Usually in that multiple choice format you're used to, there's not a lot of cognitive, and it's again focused on that one topic, a lot of cognitive shifts for each multiple choice item. And the four section six option is unique. It's different, it's novel, it's unfamiliar, okay? The other thing, a lot of times your exams are based upon you know quizzes and things that were reviewed specifically in, in class. Exams on the OT um, on the OTR exam also ask you to apply and analyze the information. So sometimes it's not straightforward and cut through. You, you have to think about those nuances of the practice setting of the stage EOT process. So that's the activity demands are very different. The environmental context are very different. Most of the time you take an exam in the familiar environment, either at home or in your dorm room, if it's not electronically, or a classroom that usually you've been in before and you can come and go as you please, okay? You can often pick your favorite spot in the classroom, okay? And you're surrounded by people taking the same test, okay? And it begins and ends at the same time. And, you know, you basically are there at the same time, okay? You're going to be taking it at Pearson VU. It's not part of my training, it's Pearson, but it's an unfamiliar setting. Test, you've got to go through a security check. You're not going to be able to select where you're sitting. And people you're going to be taking with strangers who are taking a diversity of tests and they're coming and going. So it's very, very different. So take the accommodations if you're eligible. They do adhere to ADA accommodation guidelines. TAs can include extra testing time, a separate testing room and breaks. The ability, because you're in a separate testing room, to read aloud, because a lot of people use that as an accommodation. The PSMVU test centers where your test will be administered do allow test takers to use comfort items that don't require pre-approval. And we list those comfort items in box 1-1 in chapter 1. And you can see there's quite a bit that are allowed that you don't need approval. So if you're worried about, you know, that you take insulin, that you have a spinal cord stimulator, that you use TENS, have a catheter, you know, any of those things that you have a hearing aid, if you need an ergonomic school, stool to elevate your legs, I, I have one right now, okay, because I have a bad back, so I have my my thing to make sure I'm at 90-90, you can bring that with you, okay, I have my lumbar support, if you have any mobility devices, earplugs, bandages, okay, those are all allowed, okay, and information how to attain, okay, TAs are available in the testing accommodation book, and because it is so significant, we, we cover a lot of information about the testing accommodations in the review and study guide manual, because we know it often makes a difference between passing and failing the exam. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. Okay. Whether you take, use accommodations or not, there's a lot you have to study. So the review and study guide is a very good primary source. As I mentioned, the first edition came out in 2000. We're now in the 10th edition. You don't get to get a book into the 10th edition unless people feel it's worthwhile. Okay? So the thing that makes it worthwhile is it is authored by OT educators who are content experts in the field. These are people who practice this information, people who teach this information. They are committed to making sure we provide current and accurate information about the OTR certification exam content format and procedures. That's in chapter one and two. I'll show a screenshot of that. But then chapters three to 16, they want to make sure we make sure that we fully cover and adequately test the content knowledge that's required to pass the MBCOT exam. At the end of each chapter, there's content specific review question. And then there's three online practice exam that mirror the OTR exam. And then we want to make sure that in our book, we provide you sufficient information about effective test taking and time management strategies, help you finish the exam within the allotted time. So the books are really a one stop for everything you need to pass the exam. Okay, as I mentioned, chapter one will tell you all the information from how do you apply, the format, the content, many of the things I just covered this evening, testing, accommodations, scheduling, preparation. And then two covers all your prep, all your exam preparation, how you develop an individualized study plan, what are some hints, how do you reason through. In exam one, we also give you hints for correctly determining the correct answer. Okay, now the book is big. There's a lot of information in it. So it is, you know, there's 16 chapters. 
So the all-inclusive nature can make it appear daunting. But I think it's important that the review and study guide has a lot of stuff in it that breaks up the content and also helps you focus in on what you really need to learn. There's 296 table boxes and figures that highlight what is must-know information and support visual learners. There's 287 of those exam think boxes that describe the relationship of content to the OTR exams. You know, okay, how does this relate? And provide exam prep strategies and test taking hints. So to help you study effectively and increase your exam ep efficacy. There's 152 caution boxes that make sure you know the precautions and contraindication risk factors and actions you need to take that don't cause harm and, and don't reflect best practice. And there's 66 red flags for the things that are really unsafe and contraindicated and serious risk factors that are known to cause harm and require immediate action. By focusing on these, you will you can have a very targeted review plan, exam preparation plan. Okay. The other thing to know at the end, what helps increase the efficacy of the of the review and study guides at the ends of chapter three and 16, there are con open-ended content specific review questions to help you kind of jumpstart the thought process they will you will need to effectively answer exam items. So you're going from field work and you're going from maybe a capstone into thinking very, you know, holistically and not in a bump, bump, bump of how you need to answer objective exam. That's a big transition. So these questions provide a transitional phase for you to think about what is the content you need to know to pass the exam, but in a way that's not in an objective format. Okay, so to really think about. These are great for study groups. And here's two representative examples. What level of motor control must be present for a person to be accounted for CI, constraint induced movement therapy. And what are three evaluation tools that you would use to assess a person's cognitive level using Allen's cognitive DCD model? And how would you apply them in practice situations? Again, these are good for study groups because you think about, oh, where would I use the Allen's cognitive screen? Where would I use the, um, the routine task inventory? And it gets you thinking about that because that's how it will play out on the exam. The other thing that helps the exam, the review and study guides be quite effective is you get access to Therapy as an online learning portal for 12 months. And this learning portal contains three exams that are purposely designed to simulate the MBCOT exam. So each of the exam has 180 items, just like the OTR exam. That includes those traditional three and four options and single, you know, three or four options, single response multiple choice and the six option multi-select scenario sets. They are distributed throughout the three exams, just like on the um, MBCOT exam. At the end of the review and study guide, it ends with guidelines on how to effectively use these in your exam preparation. And after you take the exam, you get a score report that provides very detailed information about your test taking performance that can be used to develop a target exam preparation plan. Okay. So immediately after you finish the exam, you, you click exit you will get a portal that will display your score in percentage because we can't do like MBCOT does because we don't have the pool of people to do a weighted score, but it will give you a percentage. It will also identify the amount of time you took the exam to complete it. So you see if you're in the four hour range, unless you have accommodations and you could, you know, you have the extra time, which items you answer correctly and incorrectly. And it gives you the percentages of items you answer correctly according to the four domains we just reviewed five critical reasoning skills, which I'll show a shot of, and nine content categories that line up with the review and study guide chapters. When you receive this report, you can immediately click on each exam item and it will link you and go directly to a detailed explanation about its rationale. It also has a function, which I don't have a screenshot because it's it, we're just it's it's being finalized for the new format of the exam, but it has a function. Say we took a we saw the portal the other evening and we took a question about someone with um, peripheral neuropathy was the presenting symptom. And the question was actually about, you know, not related, it was about someone expressing concerns about their ability to um, engage in a specific activity. But say you say yourself, I don't know peripheral neuropathy. Well, underneath it, each one it has questions. What is peripheral neuropathy? You could click on that. What, is ca what causes peripheral neuropathy? You can click on that. It has questions that are most asked questions say about diagnosis, but then it has a place where you can put in your own question. You know, what are prevention strategies? What are treatments? And it will give you feedback on those that, that information. So you get a lot of information from those score reports. And these guidelines for, for scoring, for using the score report data, 
to how to revise, because when you get that, what do I do with it? So how do I revise my exam preparation plan? In chapter two, we give very specific guidelines on how to use this information. And that's unique to therapy. Yeah, no other product that gives practice exams provides this information. And this is clearly stated out. So it tells you, here's my exam domain, domain content report. That's my content, what's my utility. So here we give the domains and it then tells you if they're less than satisfactory, this is what you need to do. For the different types of reasoning, if they're less than satisfactory, this is what you need to do. And chapter two has extensive information and it's been expanded by Dr. Kara Inda on how to develop your critical thinking. She's added more learning exercises on how to do that in chapter two. So we help you learn how you can use this information. Um, we can a specific content area, okay? If I, these are, these are the content areas that you'll get, nine categories and if they're less than satisfactory in a, in a specific area, it tells you, you know, let's review those, those um, rationales. Let's look at the content chapters that align with the score report and go to those chapters. Oops. And here is the table that tells you exactly which chapters you need to review. Okay. And it lines up. So this is the quarter category and these are the chapters. So you, then you have the book to go back and review. So in conclusion, what's the bottom line? on therapy as review and study guides. They're efficient. Use a single test that synthesizes all the content knowledge that may be tested on the MBCOD exam. Having one resource simplifies your preparation and saves time. It also saves you money. Buying a lot of products is expensive. It also can get confusing. Confusing because a little switch here or there can sometimes, you know, say, well, they're saying it this way, what's right? Okay. I can attest that our chapters have current information from the current textbooks that MBCOD uses. So we're the only single purchase certification exam preparation product includes all the content required to pass the OTR exam, has content specific questions to assess your knowledge and jumpstart your studying at the end of each chapter, three to 16. Effective test taking and time management strategy help you successfully answer all exam items within the allowed time and three online practice exams. So when you look at the price, it's, I think it's 95 right now. I think it's going up to 99, see 99.5, but it'll be a, a, not a hundred dollars. Okay. When you look at the combination of three exams and all the information you get into one product, it really does become more economical than buying a lot of different products. And we give you that guidance on how to use your results. Okay. Important thing to know, though, you can know your content. And there are many students who know their content, but they still struggle how to pick that best answer. And that makes sense because in OT Pearls, we teach you to think holistically and think of every nuance. So you think of what about this, what about this? It's very hard to decide on one out of three choices, one out of four choices, or three out of six choices, okay? So the, the course helps you learn how to do that, how to effectively determine correct answers. They are provided, and they also help you develop that targeted study plan. Chapter two does give some information, but it really helps have someone walk you through how to do that targeted study plan. And that's where the course manual comes in. The course fee includes the 10th edition of the review and study guide and a 200 plus page course manual that basically provides a roadmap of walking you through the review and study guide, extensive exam study hints for the content and numerous self-assessment exam prep forms that you can use. We offer the courses online and on campus, and there are school discounts. So basically book, class, and pass has been the therapy a theme for over 20 years, 25 years now. This is an example of just one of the self-assessments. Chapter five tends to be the most daunting chapters for many people because a lot of human development. And basically therapy, a course instructor will walk you through, how do you assess yourself by looking at the chapters to know everything that is a plus and check becomes what you must review. Everything that is a negative or zero is what you must study. Remember, what you know is also on the exam. So you want to make sure you review that. So, oops. So a little bit more about the courses. They are very highly interactive. They're taught by very qualified OT instructors with 34 years of 30 to 40 years of experience. They provide essential information about the exam. Okay, to ensure that you pass. So the OTR exam, we also do for the code exam. They emphasize active learning. So like I said, that six option item during the course, you would actually go through what made those six options either correct or not correct. 
And what was the strategy used to pick that? What was your clinical and critical reasoning needed to select the best answer? So we do a lot of strategies for breaking down the single response multiple choice items and the multi-select scenario test item. The course has been updated to include these new items. As, and the um, practice exams that accompany the text are being updated as we speak. We also do a lot about time and stress management. Life is stressful enough. There's no need to make that preparing for the exam is stressful. It's a doable task. And our course instructors are experts in helping you guide you into a manageable plan that does not overtax you. Okay. And that's where they use the manual and the review and study guide in concert to walk you through that. So the bottom line about the review and the exam prep courses, they're cost effective and they work, to be honest. Simply put, there has returned to many programs every year for over 20 years. Paula can attest, I can attest. I have gone to the same schools now for over 20 years to do the exam preparation course. We go, we go back because it works. The fact that the course fee includes a review and study guide with three online practice exams can eliminate the need to buy other products and that increases the value. And by the way, even though we go back to many programs, please know that over 95% of therapy ed's courses that they're hosted by schools, but they're open to anyone. So if your school doesn't host, you can still sign up and take a course. And I think the bottom line is program directors and deans who fund this course sometimes for their students and students who pay their way we're all very astute about your respective budgets and what you want, your outcome. So they don't waste time. You don't waste time and money on products that do not work. That's basically what it comes down to. Um, in 2022, 2,183 people took the course evaluation. There was more people who took the course, but you know, doing the course evaluation online, not everybody does that. And out of that, 98% said that they would recommend the course to others. Okay, so it's a very high percentage. Okay. I want to cover briefly some of the other resources we have to help you prepare. As Paula mentioned, she is a tutor. Okay. Our tutoring is very personal. It's either done one-to-one -one or in small groups based upon your preference. Experienced therapy ed instructors like Paula and others provide very personalized tutoring They're not, that's individualized to your unique exam prep needs. They do not tutor while they're driving in the car or folding laundry. Okay. They are focused on you to focus on your unique prep needs and challenges. And then it includes preparing to take the exam for the first time, proactive, if you have very high test anxiety, you want to help diminish it, develop and implement a targeted study plan, apply those reasoning skills to determine correct answers, develop stress and time management skills you need, and modify if you did not pass the exam. How do you modify that if you're not passing? Important thing I want to let you know, therapy ed will never, ever contact you to sell you more sessions. You decide how many sessions you want and need. It's student directed. And most students find that one to two sessions are sufficient for getting them on track for exam success. So we don't offer this huge like package and things, you know, because many people find that one to two and it's up to you. Okay. The other thing I want to highlight is our free online office hours every Tuesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. They're free to anybody. And if you're not preparing for the certification exam, um, during COVID, a lot of people who were students joined us. We would have up to 500 in, in a session sometimes. Um, each session begins with a targeted content review, kind of one of the top five must-know things you know, followed by an open Q&A. They're relevant to both OT and OTA students. They're hosted by an instructor who's a content expert in that topic. And they include time to ask questions about anything you're concerned about, test taking, the format of the exam, any specific content concerns. And this is just an, a represent. this is the topics that we review, okay? We do a 26-week cycle and we, then we repeat. We also have the YouTube channel where this session will be posted and the online office hour sessions are posted within two, two weeks of the session, remain online for a month. Donna Custer, who's a therapy ed instructor who is here um, as a guest, is, um, has done a wonderful presentation that she does every um, session, every sequence on application mindfulness certification exam preparation that's permanently posted because it's so helpful to students. How do I use mindfulness when I prepare? How do I use mindfulness while I'm taking the exam? Then there's a series of other webinars that I've done for like New York State OT Association, Inspire, um, about exam preparation. There is a exam in the week that is posted on Thursdays. And then on Sunday, the correct answer is provided. And then during the office hour session, the 
instructor who is a content expert on that topic will review and discuss why one answer is correct versus incorrect. Okay. I see there's a bunch of stuff in the chat box. So if, um, I guess, Paul, because I know you've been responding to these along the way. Yeah, so I think is... I have them covered, if any, unless anybody has any more questions. Okay. <clears throat> a lot of it, Rita, is about um, when the 10th edition will be available and is it okay to use the 9th edition while they're waiting for the 10th or just use the 9th edition and not also purchase the 10th? So I've been responding to that. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I see, um, yeah, English, I say, okay. If you have the ninth edition and you are preparing for the exam, definitely use it. Okay. Because reflexes have not changed. Wheelchair measurement hasn't changed. Couple tunnel hasn't changed. Universal, you know, um, it, depending upon when you're going to take the exam in 2024, the book, as Paula probably said, it is it is ready to be printed, okay? And is anticipated the ebook definitely will be out in December. So I would wait for that. However, if you are planning to take the exam very soon and you have the ninth edition, but then your plans get forestalled for some reason, you know, life happens. Therapy Ed will give people who have the ninth edition thinking that they were going to able to take the exam in 2023, but they couldn't, they will give you free access to the electronic version of the 10th edition. So for those of you who have the ninth edition and it winds up, you're not taking the exam for 2024, you will get online access to the ebook for the 10th edition and a code for taking the new exams with the new type of exam item of the scenario set items. Okay. How do we get that access? I would fall into that category. How can I pursue that option? Okay, I would say wait a couple weeks <laughs> until it's available, um, but say towards mid to, to um, late December, you basically contact where therapy ed says contact us, you contact them. And you say, hey, I'm one of these people who fall into that category. I anticipated, you know, taking in 2023, I have this resource, but I understand now that, you know, I, I can get access to that. And um, by that time, the staff will be up and ready um, to be able to know how to process that. Okay, we don't have, the ebook just still has to be, you know, format because thing, things get embedded in live. So it's in the process of being done, but it will be done shortly. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Other questions? Okay. I have a question about accommodations. Yes. When should we start the process of applying for accommodations? Um, the process of applying for accommodations, you have to you have to do that the same time you do your application. So when you do your application, it will say are you applying and then you do the application, but you may want to get your data together. Okay. So re go on to the testing accommodations handbook and look at what they require. Now, a very important thing to know is that the MBCOT will take documentation up to seven years. Okay. That had that document your need for accommodations. So if you got documentation when you first entered school to get accommodations, and even though you never used them, you have that documentation, you can apply that to the MBCOT exam. My other advice, if you're going to need new accommodation, and if you're still on your, you know, your school's um, roles as a student, that you haven't gotten your official transcript yet, and you're not like done with the, the university, and you need a new evaluation, I would say contact your Office of Students with Disabilities and ask for the evaluation, ask for that documentation. It will save you money. You know, use your tuition dollars and get the information that you need from your your university. Okay, so you can start that process of getting the documentation at any time. The actual completion of the testing accommodations form has to be connected to an actual application. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. I'm going to ask you answer a few more questions if you have. Yeah, I so want to here's, here's one you might want to answer, Rita. <clears throat> okay. Someone told me the exam will be heavily based on peds, geriatrics, mental health, ortho, et cetera. Is this true? Uh, I love that question. No, 
<laughs> um, but the perception of that is very real. Okay. When people take an exam, you don't remember the exam item you knew right away. If I did my field work with a lot of people with hand injuries, I'm going to nail all those questions about hand injuries and the proper splint and the use of physical agent modalities because I did my rotation in a hand clinic. If I did not do a rotation in a hand clinic, and I'm really not that big up on musculoskeletal conditions because to be honest, that's my weakest point. I loved, I worked in psych, but my brother had free just ataxia. So I love neuro stuff. So I love psych and neuro. Not so good on a musculoskeletal. I'm going to struggle with those items, okay? So people tend to remember the items they struggle with. So I have the perception of that. A lot of people say, oh, the exam is all about ethics. That's because the ethics questions are challenging. So they take you time to think about. The exam is very, very, very fair, okay? They have a whole program to make sure that they are testing the depth and breadth of OT and it is not concentrating on one area, okay? It just isn't. Um, the, the exam is fairly constructed and it, a good, I'm gonna, I wanna talk about the therapy at difference. When you are looking, there's a lot of exam preparation products out there and whatever product you choose, make sure it's accurate, okay? There's a lot of misinformation out there by some providers that is just wrong. Like the NICU, the NICU is not on the exam. I get people every once in a while, someone contact me, your book doesn't have the NICU and this place says they have a lot about the NICU. I'm like, well, they're wrong, okay? It not, does not cover the NICU. So make sure that whatever source you're using is current and accurate about the exam, its format, content, and procedures. Make sure that it's comprehensive and well integrated and organized. You know, I understand like a lot of people like to use PDFs and stuff, but remember that if you just take exam items and you print and you read the rationale and you print out the PDF related to that exam item, say for splinting, you take six exam items and you read all the things about those six exam items. And you're like, oh, I'm doing good now. I know my splinting. But all of those six, those six items about splints were related to hand injuries. Okay? <laughs> and they don't, they did not cover anything about splinting for burns, or they did not cover anything about neurophysiological, you know, strokes. Okay, or tenodesis. Okay. You will have a false sense of purity when you go into the exam that you know you splints. Now, are you going to fail the exam because you don't get an answer right because you don't know a splint for burns or you don't know tenodesis? No, you're not going to fail the exam because of that. But the problem with having content gaps in an area of practice is that when you see that item, you're like, oh, Oh my gosh, burns, I don't know burns. <gasps> Tino Yusha, I don't know. And you get that rush, okay, of that anxiety. And then you get another item that maybe was not in a question you took, so you didn't study the PDF. And it builds, okay, and the anxiety builds. And that can lead to a very negative spiral where you start questioning even the things you know. So you want to make sure that whatever you use, it's very comprehensive and organized and integrated so that you have that sense of, I know what I need to know, okay? That's where the course, the, the manual is very helpful too because it's like me and contributors walking you through the book. You want to make sure that they also give you effective test taking time management strategy so you can answer things within your allotted time, okay? And that's where the course is very, very helpful because it helps you practice doing, answering questions, you know, in multiple choice in a minute, you know, a six op option item in 90 seconds. That sounds overwhelming, but when people take the course, they learn they can do that. And then you have a bank of time that you can take the more challenging questions. Do the practice exams accurately reflect the different types of exam items you're going to require to answer? Do they cover that diversity? And do they give you that real-time experiential learning? The one thing I love about therapy when I first joined, I really did not know anything about it. I was doing my own thing with my faculty. It is very much based on learn by doing. Okay. You learn by doing. It's core fundamental to OT, which is interesting because it's founded by a PT but we call him an honorary OT or a hot <laughs> because he thinks like, right? Ray is hot. He thinks like an OT, okay? Um, it is very much learned by doing. And also we give individualized life supports between our tutors, the court, the, the um, courses, and through the online, they're free. Every Tuesday night, seven to eight, 
for any free access to someone to chat about. And make sure also that the people providing the products are experienced and well-regarded and educated would establish reputation for excellence, integrity, and service to the profession. If you look at the bios of the Therapy of Course instructors, you'll be very impressed about many of the accomplishments that our instructors have done. Many, many have been program directors. Many, many have served on a code accreditation. Many have served in state president, have served AOTA, have received awards from, from AOTA and from states. Um, they, they know what they're talking about. And the most important thing, they're committed to our code of ethics and they will never ever falsely represent something. So I, as part of the therapy team, we're very proud of the quality of our products and resources and the expertise of our course instructors and text contributors. And we really do think that if you consider these questions, you'll be able to answer yes to all of these for therapy of products. Okay, I will um, take some more questions after I end. But I, I have a couple here that I'm not able to respond to accurately. Okay. Um, for those of you who sign out on behalf of Therapy Ed team of educators, I thank you for your time and attention and wish you success on your exam and on your preparation and a rewarding career as an occupational therapist. And for more information about any of these, you can see therapyed.com. Okay, Paula, what are the additional questions? Can we exchange the ninth edition for the 10th edition if we signed up for the course in mid-December before the new 2024 format was announced and are taking the exam in January? You don't need to exchange it. You can you can just once the ebook is available, you can get the ebook with no charge. So there's no need to exchange it. And there is a lot of the content the same, but we've added a lot more pictures and a lot more table and boxes to break up the content. And obviously new information about burnout um, and vital signs and things like that. So you, there's, you can keep the book. Thank you. And there's one here I'd like to respond to. It's like, what is the layout of the exam? Can I see multiple questions at a time or one question per page? It's one question per page. And yes, you can go back and see past questions. I just thought that'd be easier than writing it, everybody. Of course. Um, and yes, and you can review and go back and change, yep. You can flag them. You can go back for whether it's the multi-select sets or if it's the regular multiple choice. So Rita, here's a good one for you. Do you recommend taking the prep course after studying on our own first since it's a two-day course and since a self-paced simulated exam takes place on the second day of the course? I think um, if you have the ability and the access and the time to study beforehand, I think that's great. You, We all know the things we feel the least comfortable in. So that if you review that information before you take the course, you'll feel more prepared and it'll be more a good assessment of your test taking skills. And then when you do, you have the course manual and you go through the course manual and you actually set up your study plan, you'll have a lot more things that are in that check and plus column than in the zero and negative because you're already reviewed. So I think if you have the capability, and I think that's true this time of year because of December, you know, a lot of people have ended their classes, they've ended their field work. They're not gonna be doing heavy duty studying, you know, and, and you know, so, and they're gonna have the course in January. Doing some prep while you have time is not a bad idea. I would not take any of the practice exams that you have access to, do not do that because it's not a good use of them. It is better to take them after you've completely studied, implement the exam preparation plan that you learned how to do in the course, and then learned all the strategies in the course. And then you'll be able to apply those strategies to that first exam. And you'll get good feedback to know how you're doing. Then you update the study plan based upon the recommendations from the course and in the manual and take a second one. And you can get that very intense feedback. And if you do that updating and take it very seriously updating, by that third exam, you're done. You don't need to take more exam items. You can go take your test. So I think it's a good idea to do that. Okay, so um, I have a question up here now. So please be clear on this, everybody. The ninth edition was published in 2019. So it does not have any of the 2024 format questions. Okay, but remember the majority of the exam is still going to be the traditional multiple choice format. And that's what the ninth edition has. What you won't have are the multi-select scenario set format. Okay, but 
um, the reasoning that you use is very similar to what you use for the clinical simulation test items. And as Rita explained earlier, I, I agree. I think that, um, I don't think the questions will be easier. I think the format, the process of answering them will be easier. It will take less time and it will let you focus more on your critical reasoning instead of um, dealing with all of the extra reading that was involved with, that is currently involved with the CSTs because um, they're lengthier and you also have feedback boxes to read. Okay, so please everybody, the ninth edition is, is based on the exam format as it is now, not for 2024 because it was published before that information was available. Yeah, it was published for the exam that was implemented in 2019. Like now we're publishing the book for the exam that's implemented in 2024. And that exam will be the same for the next four to five years. That is the trajectory. 2019 to 2023 is when they make the change. 2024 is when they decide to change. 2024 is when they implement the change. So from 2019 to 2023, it was the same exam. And now from 2024 to 2027, we're going to be in the same exam. So I have a question here. How do you join the free online office hours? Go to therapyed.com, go to OTR exam, check the drop down selection and you'll see online office hours. And then as soon as that page comes up, you'll see that there's a link to get to those. I like that you get to interact with other people who are getting ready for the exam, somebody who's an expert in the content and there's no cost to you for that. I'm so pleased that Therapy Ed continues to offer that. Yes, they're, they're quite good. The Are there any question... point deductions for blanks? No. Okay. You can skip yes. a question. However, I don't recommend that you do it. I recommend you answer it, even if you just purely guess and flag it. You can flag it and go back to it later. But think about it. If you don't have time to go back, you don't want to. I, personally, I want to go down swinging. I don't want to not at least try. And I always say if it's out of the, you know, one single select item out of out of four and i have no clue i have a 25 percent chance of getting it right if i eliminate one or it's only three options i have a 33 percent chance of getting right now how many times do we eliminate two and we're down to two that's a 50 percent chance of getting it right those are good odds never ever leave a blank pick your favorite letter and mark it as paula said you should make it a hint later on or you can just let it go because you don't have to get 100 percent on the exam but yeah never ever leave a blank I agree with Paula completely. Thank you. So I have another question up here. Do we get breaks during the exam? You want to address that, Rita, or you want me to? Go for it. Okay, so you can take breaks, but you don't get breaks, as in the clock keeps ticking. It starts at four hours and goes backwards. So um, that means you have to answer at a quick enough pace to allow for some of those questions that you need a little bit more time on because they're more challenge challenging to you and um, to, to fit those breaks in. So what you're gonna shoot for is an average of 60 of the traditional multiple choice questions in an hour. You must do 50 to just get done on time. But if you can do between 55 and 60, you're gonna build enough of a bank of time so that you can take a break. But there's no built-in breaks. And that's much, why the Much to my dismay. <laughs> yeah. That's why the course is very effective because it gets you into that timing. It gets you into the timing so you can see that it's doable. So you have that bank of time. And I so I, I'm sorry, okay. I just have one more, Rita. Um, if we have the ninth edition, would it still be helpful to complete the CST items to simulate how the scenario set items will be? Absolutely. I would do the CSTs because the reasoning is the same. It's, it's just that you're going to have, with the scenario sets, you're going to have six choices, three are correct, three are not. Right. And you'll be able to change your answer, which is why I agree. It's not that the, the content has changed as far as making it easier. The content is as challenging as ever before, but the format and the ability to change answers is much more user-friendly and less intimidating. All right, for those of you who are still here, I just wanted to say, um, please extend our apologies to your peers who were not able to join us. Um, and I do apologize. I don't know why we cut off at 300 and not 500. Um, the last time I asked, I was told there was no limit whatsoever, but we've always had 500, so I don't know why that is. So I please do extend my policy to peers, and I'll be sending a message to program directors to let them know when a next session will be scheduled. So thank you.
Okay, I'm going to end now. Will the YouTube link be posted on Community? Yes, I will be putting it on Community. Now, awesome. to, get the, to get the link, it may take a few days, but I will be doing that. And everybody, if you want to know, know more about the setup, um, go. there's tutorials on NBCOT.org. Go see right. those. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. I hope this was helpful. Thank you. Thanks for joining, everyone. Thanks for inviting me, Rita. Thank you, Paul. You got a minute to um, chat for a minute? I sure do. Oh, I guess I can end. Well, I guess everybody is clicking out, so. Oh, we need to stop recording. Oh. <laughs>